Mystery Slam podcast from ActiveMystery.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the Mystery Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham, coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario, a snowy nation's capital. We're recording this uh, a week before we're posting it, uh, so I think it's the 27th today. It is the 27th. It's the 27th. So yeah, we had a big snowstorm overnight. I think it stopped now. Just uh, about. So uh, there's only been a couple, I've only seen a couple things on Twitter about uh, OC Transville buses uh, jackknifing and heading off into the ditch. So um, could have been a lot worse. Uh, but traffic was snarled a little bit this morning. The nation's capital is white as we enter the Christmas season, the holiday season, which means Christmas parties and having to talk to people who you probably don't know and having to explain exactly what it is that you do for a living. And and I don't know about everyone else, but I generally have difficulty keeping people interested in, in the fact that I study history for a living. So today's podcast isn't so much our normal style of the podcast where we're going to engage in deep and thoughtful discussion. We're going to provide you with some anecdotes, some stories that, that if you want to take from us and tell at these sorts of parties, please feel free. Uh, we're going we're gonna to tell some of our favorite historical anecdotes, but I can't do this by myself. So for the first time ever in the history of the podcast, we're bringing in a co-host, the voice you just heard a few seconds ago, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Aaron Boyce. Welcome back. Thanks very much for having me here. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, so this one, uh, you're not a guest on this one. No, I, I, yeah, I've, I've been on a couple times, but uh, first time as co-host. That's uh, oh. quite an honor. Yeah, it's, it's definitely going to go to the top of the CV. Oh, I, oh I, I, I plan on telling everyone. I mean, as soon as I get home, I'm going to be texting. Uh, I was going to say tweeting, but I'm not on Twitter. But Facebooking, emailing, you name it, everyone that I know to, to, to check out this, uh, this episode. Yeah, you might want to tattoo that, too. Maybe, I'll Maybe it, on my forehead? Yeah. Co-host, put the date. I like it. Um, yeah. I like it's, it. There's zero downside to that. No, no. No, no, What kind of royalties would I get out of that? Well, you'll have to get the same royalties that I get from the show. Oh, then I, then I have to do it. Naturally. <laughs> Naturally. So I don't know. Now, have, but have you had the same experience with, as, as I have? You meet somebody at a party who, who doesn't really study history at all, isn't really interested in history that much. They ask you what you do, and, and you can see the, the eyes glaze over. Well, I always feel bad, actually. I, I, I have a lot of people ask me, so what do you do? And I say, well, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Ottawa. And they say, oh, okay, that's really cool. And I'll say, yeah, I, I enjoy that. And they say, so what do you study? And I understand that they're, they're being polite and that they're trying to engage in a conversation. But I always feel bad because, even I mean, I'm interested in my own topic, but I don't think anyone else out there except for maybe one or two people are actually interested in it as well. So I kind of try to think of the most generic way of describing what it is that I do. Mm-hmm. And then, so most of the time I just say, well, I study Canadian-American relations in the late 19th century. And a lot of people will just, that, that's more than enough information for them. And they just walk away. And I'm like, okay, let's move on to talking about something else yeah. here. But every so often someone will say, oh, really? What specifically? Yeah. And then I have to try to explain that I'm looking at the political union movement and what annexationism is. And that's where it gets tricky. And then I see the eyes kind of glaze over. Yeah. But other times, yeah, they say, so what do you do? And oftentimes, of course, like you, you can attest to, I sit in an archive. <laughs> and I sit in front of a microfilm machine yeah. for eight hours and watch pages go by and I tick the seconds away of my life yeah. just passing them by. So it's really not the most exciting thing to tell people. Right. And, and the thing that I get a lot is that people, well, there's two things. One, if I say I do the CBC, if it gets that far, as they say, well, what do you, like, what do you study? It usually doesn't. They just say, what do you do? And I say PhD in history. And that, that generally is the end of it. But if yeah. they say, what, what exactly do you do? And I say the CBC, it's usually followed up by them either telling me how much they hate the CBC or love the CBC. Well, I do that to you all the time. And, and then it's followed up by, by a discussion. They want to talk about a, a specific TV program on okay. the CBC. Yeah. And, yeah. and generally, I don't watch CBC TV, so I'm not really able to engage <laughs> in that. And, and so, so that's, that's kind of difficult to, uh, to really get to that. Right, like no, absolutely. To really engage on 
because I they're, again they're trying to be nice and, and sometimes the the interest is genuine. Oh, there's no doubt, and that and I should probably clarify some of my comments there. You're absolutely right. Uh, some people ask me what it is that I'm doing, and you can tell that their interest is really there and really mm-hmm. genuine. They say, "Well, I'm looking at this," and they say, "Oh, that's really cool because I know about this, that, and the other thing." Uh-huh. And, it, and it may even be 50 years later. Um, oftentimes, it kind of says, "Well, I've heard about, I've heard about." Uh, there's times where the United States wanted to grab Canada like that. Is yeah. that the same kind of thing? I say, "Yeah, that's pretty much what I'm doing," and yeah. and it's really interesting to hear those reactions. Mm-hmm. And you probably get it more often too, though, because you have to go to parties that aren't really yours because you uh, have somebody who you will soon be related to by marriage. That's right. Who has her own work parties and her own set of friends on that side. Yes. That now you have had to, that you have to socialize with. I do indeed. So yeah. whereas, whereas for me, a lot of my friends are, are history related people. I, I do have some folks outside of it, but, but for the most part, like if I'm going to a Christmas party this year, it's a history department Christmas party. Yeah, so right? so you're able to, so everyone knows what it is essentially, or even if they don't know what the topic you are doing, I mean, history is actually a, a good commonality to, right. to attach to. Right, I'm not going to the Heart Institute Christmas party. No. Which you are. Which I will be, yes. Right, so so that, so that the situation is different there, that, that you have to come up with more, probably more general discussion. Oh, absolutely. It, it, again, because I can't just sit there and say, or stand there and say, yeah, I sat in front of a microfilm machine for eight hours. Right. And a lot of people even say, well, what's a microfilm? Right. I mean, it's even at that point yeah. where it's just like, well, okay, now I've got to explain what a microfilm right. is and then go on and say, I looked at newspapers that are over 100 years old and even I'm not interested in talking about it. So I can't even <laughs> imagine <laughs> what a non-history person would think about yeah. hearing. That sounds fantastic sitting right. in front of a big box and looking at microfilms all day mm. now anecdotes we have a bunch here that we want to say we have some guests coming up in, the, in a little bit so yeah looking uh, forward to hearing what they have to say as well yeah it'll be good i'm curious as to what they're going to say yeah um based on their emails to me they have some, some some good stuff for us so perfect so first off uh you have a we're going to tell our favorite ones so first off you have a, a good sir john a mcdonald story I do. Well, more so because Johnny McDonald is one of those universal figures in Canadian history in the sense that everyone knows about him, even if uh, no one knows a lot about history, they know who Sir Johnny McDonald was. So if I was at a party and I was talking about history or not, I may share this story because, again, Johnny McDonald is just that recognizable name. And part of John A. and his charm, I guess, if you will, was his public drunkenness. <laughs> And so if you're at a, if you're at a party and you're having a few, a few beverages uh, and you're just enjoying the atmosphere, it'd be nice to relate this story. Now, there's so many tales about Sir John A. Macdonald's drinking. Now, of course, some people have said that it was a problem. Others said it's just a thing of the time and so that everyone was drinking. But McDonald's penchant for drinking was really quite clear, even during his own time. And what I love about it is that he was the first person to make fun of it. Or he would be the first person to engage Mm. That he was drunk. <laughs> I've got a couple of things here um, that I've gleaned from uh, a couple of sources that I that I was kind of reading through. I, I looked it up a little bit because I want to make sure about this. And there's this one tale where Johnny McDonald was on a campaign, and he arrived for a debate, but he was so drunk that when he took to the platform after his opponent had finished speaking, he quickly threw up. <laughs> So there's McDonald, he throws up on stage, wipes his mouth and then smiles and he says, and I quote, every time I hear this liberal speak, it turns my stomach. That's outstanding. And the crowd went nuts. Oh, how good is that? The crowd just went nuts. And I I, I read this and I just thought, I have to tell this little story because I was howling with laughter as I'm reading this. That's so good. Like, I, I can't even imagine a politician having the guts to do that now. Yeah. Well, I mean, not, of course, showing up drunk anywhere, but making light of that situation. Well, we have politicians doing that. Well, yeah. But anyway, I, was just, I, I thought that was just outstanding. That's really good. So, and then, of course... Well, but then you wonder if he threw up because he was drunk or he maybe timed it. Like, is he just lucky in having perfect timing like that? I don't know. No, he may have timed it. I mean, or, he, or he do you was, think maybe he he could do that on command? So I've heard people can do that. He's Never. well, he was pretty politically savvy. I mean, he, the yeah. man was brilliant when it came to politics and winning a crowd. So I mean, it might have been on purpose. Yeah, that's brilliant. Absolutely outstanding. Could you imagine if that happened in a YouTube world? Oh, that would go viral. 
like so fast and not not just the viral video of it itself there would be like the remixes <laughs> to it <laughs> And people would cut <laughs> things around it, and then the uh, the mocks of them, like people uh, doing it on their own and yeah. trying to recreate it. And oh, it would be it would be unbelievable. It would be a, a sensation. It'd be a phenomenon. Oh, like, it'd be great. Like nothing else. Oh, it'd be it'd be great. Hundreds of millions of hits. There's no doubt yeah. about it. So that's what I mean. The, one of those things that I, I feel as though you could uh, at a party, you could just kind of that's tell a good those story. Things. That's a good story. Yeah, and I mean, uh, again, you don't need to know very much about who he was as a politician. You really don't even need to know too much about what he was like a man or as a man. But just knowing that this character, this great personality Mm -hmm. had this this uh, little soft spot for the drink and then you can relate this little tale. So I feel so it helps to break the ice. That's a good story. Uh, story. Well, thanks. I'm I'm glad I was able to. Nicely done. Thank you. So now I have to tell it like... You're gonna you're gonna start with that. You're, you're gonna have to follow. Hey, you're gonna lead hey, with hey, that. Hey, I'm co-hosting this. I mean, there's there's That's no true. way that I'm I, I'm gonna try to steal the spotlight. <laughs> well, you know, I still have the producer on my side. Yes, that is true. Um, although I want to fire him really bad. Um, well, he's pretty terrible. He's the worst producer ever. So my the one I like to tell that my go-to is a William Henry Harrison story, partly because he's a very little known figure. Although he does get a shout out in the Simpsons episode, the uh, and we, and we've talked about that numerous times. It is so oh, yeah. brilliant. So William Henry Harrison, he was the president uh, for about a month, and what had happened was William Henry Harrison was an older gentleman when he when he won uh, the American presidential election, and he was a great orator. He really liked to give speeches and long speeches. So when he was uh, during his inauguration held in. Uh, January. Or yeah, January. 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 And Washington, D.C., it's not the coldest place in the world, but it tends to get a little chilly. Absolutely. And William Henry Harrison was hellbent on giving a great inaugural address. It's going to be one of those speeches that just goes down in American history. Everyone remembers it. Great speech. It's going to be quoted forever. And he goes on for about two hours. And it just so happens that while he's doing so, or in the immediate aftermath, he gets pneumonia. And he dies from his speech. And nobody really remembers the speech. (laughs) 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 So probably because he died. I mean, maybe the speech would be more famous if he didn't die, but he died. Yeah, his death outdid his speech, his great grand inaugural speech. But nobody remembers, like nobody really remembers him. I mean, I've taken however many American history courses that cover the 19th century and it's come up in one. He, he's made an appearance in one. Wow. One of the courses. I'm surprised he even made it in one. Yeah. Not only Except that, as a passing footnote, maybe. No, not only that. He got a half hour of policy discussion of William Henry Harrison's policy. For his 30-day presidency. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. So there you go. So William Henry Harrison. That's my go-to, usually. And then, because I can tie that into the Simpsons episode, because the line, it's the song about lesser-known presidents. <laughs> Again, that's one of those things that uh, for avid watchers of the watchers of The Simpsons, they will hear that line and think, "Oh, hey, I know him, yeah. Henry Harrison. I don't know why I know him, yeah. but hey, he was a guy that died, right?" And, yeah, yeah, yeah. So those are our sort of stories of things that happened in the past that we like to tell. Now, some people also want to hear about exactly what it is we do in archive stories. I think yes. everyone who studied history at a graduate level, at least, has at least one archive story. Oh, yeah. That they can tell. So, and yours actually just happened, or one of yours just happened recently. Yeah, one of the more memorable ones, and not just because it just happened uh, recently, but I was down in Toronto a couple weeks back on a research trip. There was a couple archival film that I needed to look at at the University of Toronto and at uh, the Archives of Ontario at York University, which, by the way, for any listeners out there, if you need an excuse to go visit the Archives of Ontario, find it. Yeah. It is an absolutely beautiful building. It is a great place to go. It's just... A fantastic archive. Yeah. So there's my little plug for the Archives of Ontario. But uh, my personal tale takes place down at the University of Toronto. And I was going to the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library, where a specific phone was located. And I was very, very eager to get there. So I got uh, to the archives right at 9 o'clock. I knew I was going to have a lot of work to do. So I finally, I got there quite early, 
wasted a bit of time, finally got in there, really excited, ordered the materials, and the receptionist told me, okay, so that material will be ready for you at 10.30. It was 9.15. Hmm. And I didn't bring anything with me. I thought I, I took it for granted that I'd be able to just show up and have access to this material right away. So I thought to myself, this is, this is not good. Yeah. How am I going to waste an hour and 15 minutes in order to, to get to this material? Now, luckily, there was a, a professor down at the University of Toronto who I will not name his name specifically, but here's a shout out if you're listening, know who you are. Thanks again very much. Um, Such a shill. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to on this one. But uh, so I sent him a, a quick message to see if he was available to get a cup of coffee. We had been uh, extending or exchanging emails for quite some time. And I thought, he's busy at work, he probably doesn't have time. I thought, you know, I'm really catching you off guard. And I got the message back saying, sure, I'm on my way down. I thought, this is incredible. So about five minutes later, he comes down. Uh, we introduce ourselves for the first time. And immediately, my first thought is, this is a great guy right here. I mean, I had already knew that from the emails that we exchanged back and forth. He was being really, really helpful. And long story short, essentially, I thought maybe 20 minutes I'd be able to say, hey, thanks very much. Not and really no going there. Next thing I know, we talked for an hour and a half. We were chatting about, <laughs> about, about his dissertation and mine and how they were really similar to one another. And he was giving me some great ideas. He helped me out with a bunch of things. And it was just amazing. And I felt as though this, this is not your typical visit down to the archives. I mean, this is uh, this is something special here when you actually sit down with someone and talk mm -hmm. history and mm -hmm. someone who's really engaged with it as well. So yeah, that was just outstanding. And then I was, it was 11 o'clock, my material was there and I got to spend the rest of the day at the University mm -hmm. of Toronto at uh, the Rare Book Library down there. And it was just great, just a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. And before you get too ahead of yourself, you, you're already engaged. So no. I am, I am. That the, is the way you're talking true. about it. Yes, I know, I know. I, and I told him that too. I said, I'm gushing over you, man. I, I mean, I don't know what to say. Total man crush right there. Well, that's fine. I mean, it, it's nice when you meet somebody who is interested in what you do and you guys could relate to the topic uh, that you were talking about, that yeah. you're down there to research, and and who's really nice about it. and. Who, who you can engage with in that because that doesn't happen all that often. No, exactly. I, not that not people aren't nice, but that people who study similar things and you can you have a chance to sit for an hour and a half uninterrupted yeah, and just talk about it. That yeah. doesn't happen often. No, and it, it was just like this. Just It was just a conversation. It wasn't forced. It wasn't anything. It was just a great exchange of ideas yeah. and a great conversation. It was just, it was awesome. Yeah. So it was a very positive uh, archive experience. I have yeah. a very negative archive experience. Now, this one didn't happen to me. And actually, I just heard this story yesterday from Patrick Pollack, who's just finished his PhD here. And he's now a sessional. And he, he was he studies, uh, or, or the talk yesterday was about Polish communists in Canada uh, from the 20s to the 50s. And he told a story that uh, before the Second World War, the commissioners, or the, the representatives, the diplomats, the Polish diplomats were all changed out. So the ones who were here before had a, hit a bunch of documents pertaining to their communist efforts in Canada. And they hid them away in the consulate, marked them all as confidential, hid them away. And it wasn't until 2002 that a maintenance person at the consulate found these boxes. And the consulate was in Sandy Hill. And, and if you know Ottawa at all, Sandy Hill is also where the University of Ottawa is. Uh, so Patrick lives, lived in Sandy Hill and the consulates in Sandy Hill. And, and I think everyone, there's an idea, and I had this before I moved to Ottawa, that these embassies and consulates were grand places. That's what I thought when I first moved here. The, the, for the most part, they're not. They're, they're just sort of old houses. I mean, I live two blocks or two doors down from the Greek embassy. Um, and, and if you're living in my neighborhood, you're not in some great... <laughs> place right so so it's just like an old house that's been that was uh converted into offices for the uh consulate so this main guy found this stuff and there was a story in the paper about it so patrick got very excited uh knowing that these documents were available or or at least had been found and they pertained to what he was interested in so he thought wow great stuff in ottawa that speaks specifically to polish communism hmm. Before he could access those, of course, the, the Polish government had to declassify any of the documents. So these documents were actually sent to Warsaw, <laughs> declassified and put in the Polish archives in, in Warsaw. No. So for Patrick to find or to reference the documents that were found roughly five minutes from his house, he had to travel to Warsaw. Oh. Yeah. That's kind of a downer. That's, oh. Yeah. 
So there you go. And it's not like it's not like trying to go or if you have to go to a foreign country, it's not like hopping over the border here and going to the United States. No, I mean, you're man. That oh yeah, that's terrible. Yeah, well, I guess you get a trip to Warsaw out of it. Yeah, but well, well, I mean, yeah, that's def- that's a good way of looking at it. But that's but, that's yeah. a long way to go to get things that are yeah. not even a kilometer from your house. Yeah, it also took two years too. So they were found. I think he said they were found in two thousand two, and it took two years for them to be declassified and made available to him. So we'd hang around knowing that they were available <laughs> or knowing that they'd been found uh, but not being able to, to reference them. Man, yeah, that's uh that's such that's a tease, right? Oh, yeah. Hey, look, our first guest is here. Perfect. Yeah. And this segment is brought to you by Salad. I'm totally using that uh, <laughs> as we welcome in James Morgan, our first guest. Welcome to the podcast, James. Thank you. So you you have a rather interesting past before getting into the academic history you worked in radio for a long time. I did. I was a uh, freelance, a uh, combination freelance and salaried uh, reporter and news announcer, and I did some work in print journalism for uh, close to six years. Give us your best radio voice. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> now that you put him on the spot, yeah. I'll try it again. Uh, well, I, I think we had a... Uh, Do you need something to read? You can read it. Uh, well, something you written know, down. Is the weather report there or something? No. I, don't know. I don't know if that's any good. Fans scream praise or outrage with little acknowledgement of a middle ground. It is not surprising that our prime ministers are prone to being misunderstood. Well, there's a lot of truth to that. <laughs> I, that's not an apology for the prime minister past or present. <laughs> I, love it. I, I love watching you present, too, because you can tell... Because you, you read your papers, and sometimes you sort of go off script a little bit. And you, there's such a difference in your voice and the way you present. That's what you, it's people It's so say. good. I, it's I, so I, much fun to watch. I presented a paper not long ago at a conference in Montreal, and uh, I had a couple of people say that to me. And, uh, and it was, uh, I, I guess I don't notice it. I don't notice it. It's just, oh, it's great. It's just what I'm used to. <laughs> I normally don't like watching people read papers, but it's brilliant to see. Oh, it's that's just so much fun. That's good. <laughs> Thanks. All right. What do you got for us in terms of anecdotes? Because you have a bunch. So, so many anecdotes. <laughs> I, I, and I was thinking about this before I came here and uh, a couple of days ago and driving here in the car. You know, I think, uh, you know, as historians, we use sources, both primary and secondary. And I, I think in a lot of ways, the journalist makes, fabricates the source. And I don't mean fabricate in a false sense. Hopefully, uh, I, better you know, not. I, <laughs> pending legislation. <laughs> Here you go. Yeah, exactly. No, I think that a, a journalist, in a lot of ways, makes a source that is end, ends up being very valuable to a historian later on. Uh, both primary and secondary sources. I think journalists are better at making a primary source. And looking back now, I, you know, the, the years I spent in that business, I felt like I, I feel now like I was making primary sources that uh, historians might use later on. Uh, just through the places I worked, the people I encountered while I worked, and the types of stories I covered. Not many people can say that they're among the very few ever who, uh, aside from qualified uh, technicians and scientists, to ever be actually right inside a nuclear reactor. Uh, when I was working uh, at a radio station in southwestern Ontario, uh, in a, about five or six years ago, uh, the Bruce Power facility on Lake Huron, the one entire plant was being refurbished. Uh, it was the first time ever a reactor has been s- uh, sufficiently decontaminated to the level that the average person can go inside it. We basically all went in wearing, uh, you know, one-piece pajama suits. That got a lot of laughs. Um, and uh, the only precaution was that uh, the individual who let us let us, this group of local journalists let us through, said, uh, don't scratch your nose. Um, yeah, so we were in there probably 10 or 15 minutes. Wait, wait, wait. Well, why can't you scratch your nose? Well, like the inside of your nose or the well, outside well, of your outside, nose? Uh, um, just scratch the outside of your nose. And he said, because if there's anything on, a particle on your finger or on your nose, uh-huh. that could, you know, transmit it somehow. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, we were all just wearing these, like, paper pajama suits. Uh, you know, it looked like a really cheaply made-for-TV science fiction movie, but it was into I mean, it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Uh, and there again, I was working mostly in small towns and rural areas, and people would think nothing happens there. Where the only culture is agriculture, as I often like to say, 
some of the people I met, uh, you know, you go to a village of uh, 2,100 people on a stormy Saturday night, late winter, and uh, Stephen Lewis packs the high school gym. Uh, I interviewed him in the high school's in the high school's library. A uh, local organization sponsored him to come and speak. He was just finishing up his tenure as uh, UN uh, commissioner on HIV/AIDS. Uh, he joked that uh, the last time he'd been to that same part of rural Ontario was when he was the provincial NDP leader in the 1970s. And being a very conservative area, he didn't get the reception back then that he was getting at that time. <laughs> Uh, I mean, nobody would ever think that uh, you know somebody, someone as uh, you know as intelligent and as eloquent as Stephen Lewis would uh, come to a, a small agricultural community. Who is the favorite person that you've met? Oh, there's there's a lot of favorites I have. I, I would one. say no fence it. We don't we don't fence it on this we, show. We don't fence it. Eh? <laughs> um, Actually, we do it all the time. I should yeah, say that's that. the, uh, <laughs> rules. Uh, there are so many. I mean, I, it wasn't even necessarily people themselves. Uh, sometimes people who worked for other people were just as easy to get along with. I've met so many politicians. Well, they're not interesting. Well, some of them actually were, and, and some of them I found, regardless of their partisan affiliation, to be really decent people. Mm -hmm. There's ones, quite plainly, I'll say that I don't think we're very decent people. <laughs> you want to name names? No, I don't think I'll name names today, but uh, th there are some individuals that, uh, I mean, I think uh, party, party affiliation means absolutely nothing in the merits of a, of a person in politics. One more anecdote, though. I, okay. I, I mean, I, I, I interviewed Peter Mansbridge. Mm. That's kind of scary when you are the one interviewing Peter Mansbridge. Right. It wasn't a particularly stressful topic or anything, but uh, I was at an event in Stratford, the local historical society had an event for surviving uh, war brides in the area. They had an event, uh, you know, there was tea, of course, tea and cake and dramatic presentations and singing and this kind of thing. And the MC for it was Peter Mansbridge, who actually lives in Stratford. And uh, he had to leave right at the end, so I ran outside and talked to him on the step. He was in a hurry to get to a uh, the uh, spring premiere of a play starring his wife, actress Cynthia Dale, at the Stratford Festival. And uh, I found him to be very, very personable individual. Even in that circumstance where he wants to leave even and you're, in, and you're he, not letting even him. Even in that circumstance. <laughs> uh, he had his younger son with him and, you know, they were eager to literally run up the hill. There's a soccer field below the, the festival theater. That's the, the thing that they don't show in Stratford, you know, behind it's just a, a municipal soccer field. You know, he was in a hurry to run up the hill to uh, to see this play. Uh, I covered a, uh, once it was opening night of the Stratford Festival, and uh, the Ontario Coalition of Poverty bust protesters out from Toronto to Stratford to uh, try to crash the event. Mm -hmm. It was a near riot around the uh, festival theater. And... Uh, huh. I don't think of, of people going to see a play at Stratford as being the worst offenders well, of, of capitalism. Th their idea was that this is a place for rich people, rich and especially opening night. I mean, uh. Uh, some of the people showing up at opening night are fairly well-off people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a very surreal experience when you see protesters ready to ready to just uh, attack the crowd or the lineup. Uh, phalanxes of riot police brought in from all over Ontario. Remember what the play was? Uh, no, I don't remember what the play was. Uh, you know, because it'd be good if it was a play that had like some sort of a fight scene. There's, there's always well, there's always sword fights in, in yeah, you know, Shakespearean sure. plays or something. So, uh, but you know, these uh, riot police, the protesters, and then I'm seeing in the same, you know, walking up the sidewalk to go in, all dressed in their tuxedos and uh, evening gowns are. Uh, you know, first is uh, Bob Ray and his wife, and then right behind is uh, Stephen Page. <laughs> so it was a very strange experience. That's a bit of an eclectic, uh, eclectic audience. They, well, they were chatting together. I think they have some political similarities. <laughs> but then uh, along those lines, then, James, if, if you can't pick uh, the favorite person that you've interviewed, can you think about 
your favorite story that you covered, one that specifically sticks out in your mind. I mean, you've told a couple here, but like one that just when you when you think back to your journalistic career, just that it always jumps out. Be it because it was an amazing event, or it was hilarious, or it was a goof up, or something along those lines. Well, I think uh, the ones I remember the most are probably the most unfortunate. I uh, had the very diff. I was in the very difficult position of covering uh, the funeral of someone from my hometown who was uh, in the army and was killed in Afghanistan. Uh, and it was someone I knew, and he was a friend of a friend. So I had, you know, seen him a few times. I knew who his family was, a uh, town of 5,000 people, and you've lived there for a few years. It's pretty hard not to know. Uh, he came from, he was one of 13 children too, so they, you know, they were almost a town unto themselves. That was extremely difficult. I didn't want to give up the story and hand it off to somebody else. Uh, but uh, that was just a you know, miserable experience. The family wouldn't allow reporters uh, to actually be in the church for the, for the funeral service, which I think was good. We respectable individuals were uh, all lined up in our cars in the pouring rain on the highway in front of the church, and uh, inside uh, there was a major news outlet that uh, sent someone in uh, just as a ordinary anonymous mourner and sat in the uh, congregation and uh, took notes the whole time and it was in some of the larger papers the next day. That prompted a lot of, I, I was outraged by that. I thought it was so disrespectful. Um, and I also, when I was working in uh, eastern Ontario, I wasn't far from CFB Trenton, and I used to cover repatriation ceremonies there. Those stand out as the stories I hated to hear about. I mean, as soon as you came across the wire that someone was killed in Afghanistan, you go, oh no, here I go again. <laughs> I'm going to end up out of the base in a couple of days. What upset me about that was the circus that would develop almost along the road at the entrance to the base. I know people were being respectful, trying to be respectful and patriotic, but, uh, you know, when... When the uh, door of an airplane opens up and, and a uh, casket's carried out, I don't think the right thing for people to do is, is shout, you know, uh, hooray, he's home, you know, and, and clap. I, I It just didn't seem seem right. I mean, it's, you know, there's a there's a son, there's a father, there's a, you know, uh, in there, <laughs> uh, there's a family standing nearby that's, uh, that's lost someone. You'd get the story and then you'd... Uh, go back in the car and never left right, you know, started up right away to drive back. It was always, uh, you had a few minutes to try to uh, recollect your emotions, I think, at least, at least for me. Those ones stand out as the worst. Anything particularly funny, I, I think the funniest story, funniest story. <laughs> There's the non <laughs> That's right the there. worst transition ever. It was a bad transition. Uh, but I'm not the producer. So. Anything, the, the funniest, I think, was the time I interviewed Oprah. No, not that Oprah. Uh, not Oprah Winfrey. I, I, I'm not a big fan of her, so I wouldn't want to... Really, I, 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 it probably wouldn't go well anyway. There was a uh, a farm animal organization. I forget the exact name of it. Supposed to teach children about proper raising of livestock. And they had a talking doll made up called Oprah. And it, it, it was an acronym for something. It just turned out it was called Oprah, and I uh, went to this uh, event they had, and, and, <laughs> and it, it was the lead story the next morning on, on the farm news ah. the station I was working with for at the time, and uh, yeah, I interviewed Oprah. Nice. She, she didn't look or sound anything like <laughs> Oprah Winfrey. Um, she wasn't near as wealthy. She, uh, if she didn't have somebody behind the scenes, behind a curtain, talking into a microphone, she wouldn't have been able to communicate, so... Mm. Uh, did this other Oprah draw a big crowd as well, though? I think there was about five or six, <laughs> five or six of us. Oh, okay. so it was a little smaller. A little bit. A little okay. bit smaller. A little bit. Yeah. All right, James Morgan, you got to run. You, uh, you're mentoring graduate students. That's right. I have to so head over you got to that office next. So you got to take off. Thanks for doing this, bud. You're welcome. It was fun. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Okay. So that was James. <laughs> um, that transition I was feel- so. Amazing. I feel I feel bad. I feel as though 
I'm partly responsible for that. I, I, I think with my question, what I tried to do is I tried to goad him into telling a funny story or something like that. And then when he went in the revert in the opposite direction, I, I didn't know what to say. I kind of felt as though my question was stupid or it was a bad <laughs> question to ask. And so, that was brilliant. That was, it was just brilliant. I love that. Ah, oh, that was so funny. Okay, so here, here's another story uh, that I like to tell, and it's a baseball-related story because I've, I've read a lot of baseball books. Uh, it's just something that I'm really interested in. And, and the history of baseball, the history of the sport. So we, we got a few ones, uh, and I'll tell one about Frank Robinson, who was a legendary uh, player for the Orioles. This is when he was with the Orioles. He was the team captain, one of the older guys on the team. And in baseball, they do a kangaroo court. Every, it, it depends on which team you're on, how often it happens. But basically, if you do something dumb on the field, you're going to get fined by your teammates in the kangaroo court. Like if you, if you have a base running air... Uh, or you drop a ball that you should catch, or, or something like that. Like something that is brilliant. Yeah, I might try to do that with my ultimate team. It's a good idea. I like it. Yeah, we've done it. Actually, our curling team is doing it. It's not a kangaroo court because you can't defend yourself, but if you miss a shot, you have to pay a buck. Huh? Uh, and at the end of the year, we're gonna buy dinner with it or something. Oh, so, that's great. So it's the same idea with baseball, but guys get a chance to defend themselves in, in the clubhouse, and people are fine, and then the money is used for something at the end. But th- this particular year in Baltimore. The Orioles hired a new clubhouse kid who didn't have any hands. Really? Yeah. Which a lot of the guys, based on sort of the story, is that a lot of the guys were uncomfortable around the, the clubhouse kid. Huh. Because he had hooks instead of Yeah, I can hands. see how that would be. A, just, yeah, not, not knowing. Yeah, I could see yeah. that. So, but the kid apparently was really good at his job. And doing all the clubhouse things, but but guys were a little uncomfortable, didn't know how to approach him. So the first time they were doing kangaroo court that year, Frank Robinson was leading it as the team captain. And the person came up, tried to defend themselves, and then you have to judge guilty or not guilty, and the rest of the team is the jury. So Frank Robinson says, all right, now it's time to vote. If he's guilty, thumbs up. If he's not guilty, thumbs down. And everyone votes. Frank Robinson immediately points to the kid with no hands and says, you are fined $10 for not voting. (laughs) 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 And at that point, everybody felt comfortable around the kid. They felt it was okay to joke around. Oh, man, that is outstanding. Oh, that is so good. And I can only imagine just the look on everyone's faces yeah. uh, as he says that yeah. I mean it but as soon as the kid starts laughing you're like, you like you know that it's okay oh yeah it's a perfect way to approach that uncomfortable situation oh that is brilliant just make a joke about it so there you go yeah hey that's yeah. sometimes the easiest way of doing it it's just exactly. uh, making light of it a little bit yeah. and you're, you're good to go yeah so you want to bring guest number two yeah that sounds a great idea alright okay guest number two Madeline Klosky who is not here unfortunately but she joins us via the Skype Madeline how are you Doing good, thanks. So you are uh, really, really far away. Couldn't make it in because of distance reasons, right? Yes, the distance of approximately four to five blocks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and I, I'll put it out there to our listeners. Uh, we had a huge, uh, we had a huge snowstorm here in Ottawa uh, overnight. But I asked Madeline; it had nothing to do with the snow. So she assured me that it wasn't just because it snowed. No, no, I'm Canadian. The snow doesn't stop. Yeah, you're, you're you're from Vancouver Island. Knock it off. You can't you you can't talk about how you you're okay with snow if you're from Vancouver <laughs> Island. Give me a break. I can I can okay. Well, you've been here in Ottawa long enough to understand what kind of snow we get here. Oh yes, oh yes. Uh, you know what? If you're gonna say that you know you're you're integrated into Ontario Quebec weather, you have to be okay with thunderstorms. Yeah, well, see, that's where I fall short. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so until you get to that point where you're used to thunder, I'm not going to give you a pass on being saying you're okay with snow. Okay, well, fair. I'll keep you updated on the thunder. Yes, <laughs> please, please do. All right, so you got a couple of good stories for us here. Uh, first one is a uh, something you found in the archives, right? Yeah, something that you know. Whenever I'm, I'm telling people about what I do, I, I sort of like to pick out some of the more quirkier things, which are usually the things that I come across when you're sort of following branch after branch and your research takes you uh, far far off the, the main path. And one of the things I came across uh, earlier this year, uh, I was looking at papers from uh, Robert Borden and uh, another minister from the First World War, uh, Thomas White, and uh, deep down in, in the depths of those uh, papers where things weren't super relevant to what I was doing, 
found a series of correspondence, um, not between uh, Prime Minister Borden, although it was it was with that sort of collection, uh, between two ministers planning to sort of uh, blackmail or leverage uh, another minister, who was one I'd never heard of before, and to get him to basically support and vote the way they wanted uh, by using his uh, preference for underage women <laughs> to... Uh, to sort of get his compliance with uh, with their plan. So, and uh, that was something that was very interesting. I think I, I sort of read those letters for probably 30 or 40 minutes before I was like, all right, this isn't why I'm here. <laughs> now, how detailed were these letters? Like, did they talk about exactly what they did? Like, were they going to go to the press? Or were they going uh, they to... Were, they were going to threaten to go to the press. They had identified one of the underage women in question, and they had her being looked after. Uh, they had her name. And basically, they were going to go confront this person and say that you need to do what we want, or we're going to basically make it known, and uh, we have this girl basically under our wing to do what we want uh, in terms of getting you to do what you or what we want you to do. And so it was it was very planned out. There was a lot of uh, you know they were very careful. They didn't mention a lot of names, but the situation and intention was very clear. That's interesting because like. <laughs> Because like, if you're not going to go, well, okay, one, I guess, how do these other ministers know that this go, this is going on? I imagine, just like anywhere, there's a lot of sort of uh, backroom, locker room chit-chat. Everybody knows everyone else's vices. His just happens to be one that uh, is frowned upon. <laughs> <laughs> During this time, could have gotten up quite a bit of uh, trouble, particularly after returning the war. This is very... Um, very uh, moral superiority type of atmosphere. So that sort of thing really wouldn't have flown very well in the public eye. Not that it would have any other time, but uh, particularly during that period. <laughs> no, but I think if, if you have a, a if that if that's your game, you're not going to really be public about it, right? That's not yeah. something that you're going to brag about in the locker room. I, I wouldn't think. Yeah, but I mean, okay, I'm thinking of this this like, great show we've been watching lately, House of Cards, and one of the, the, the main character there, Kevin Spacey, what he does is he looks for things uh, to leverage his fellow politicians with. Like he searches hmm. that out in order to, to basically make it so they owe him something. And so I was sort of imagining, you know, World War One version of this, where uh, people are scoping out all these, uh, maybe the different vices of their peers, just so they can leverage them when required. I mean, there's a lot on the line during this period. You need to get people to do what you want. Right, so they're but they're so they're probably following this guy around, or oh, someone's they following. Him around. Uh, I mean, and then they wasn't see it. Spelled out, but there's definitely been some some type of uh, recon going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, I I think that they sought out this girl, and once they realized uh, her role, and basically gave her what she needed at the time, which would have probably been you know money, lodging, things like that, and said, "Now tell us everything." How do you have that conversation? <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, you need to go watch House of Cards. It's still happening. <laughs> Yikes. All right. So that, okay. So there's one. Now that one is somewhat... Uh, it's a bit more risque. <laughs> yeah. Not, not necessarily the most uplifting of stories. No, but it's one of those ones that I, I know, at least in my experience, whenever I'm talking to people about what I do, it's one I always mention uh, since it happened because people who you know, are interested in, in history and, and what we actually do at the archives, I think finding those little kind of quirky or more drama-based uh, things is what they find sort of interesting. You know, it's not all boring snoring. It's, we actually do find some very interesting things. Yeah, occasionally we can stumble on something <laughs> that's my yeah, so, I mean, I want to emphasize, it's not like that every day, but every once yeah. in a while you come across something really uh, peculiar. And something like that, too. I think a lot of people look at the past as something, you know, very sterile, necessarily. So it's interesting to see things like that, because it's like, well, you know, not everybody was as gentlemanly and proper as we might uh, think they were. Right. That's one way to put it. <laughs> 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 All right. Now, so you, and now you got one more. And now this one, you and I... I pretty sure we're going to disagree on the merits of the plan. <laughs> uh, well, another one of my favorite things that I've sort of come across is I'm, I'm looking at a lot of newspapers during the First World War for my research to sort of uh, gain or gauge public opinion in some areas. And one of the things that I've, I've come across 
um, particularly from 1917 on when shortages, resource shortages were, were more evident. And I, I believe this started off as a satire, uh, but it sort of gained traction. And there's this whole series of, of letters that people have written into various editors in various newspapers and magazines that call in for basically the the mass uh, extermination of pets in Canada. So cats and dogs, because cats, of course, are um, drinking uh, milk and other other things, or eating meat, just like dogs are eating meat. And these are all things that are very scarce during the First World War. And since there's a lot of people who are uh, sort of going without, it's this idea that why not get rid of an unnecessary use of these uh, foods. And I think, like I mentioned at first, it sort of began as a, a satire, this idea, well, if we're doing all these extreme measures, why not do this one step further? But then it seems like some people sort of went, well, wait a minute, that's actually a good idea. Uh, because I found I'm on. I'm uh, people coming forth with this idea or supporting this idea. So something we might kind of cringe at now, or maybe you wouldn't. Nope. Uh, <laughs> no, he, he's actually that's sitting it. here smiling. I'm all in on this idea. Yes, I figured you might be. Sean's not the biggest... Uh, I'm not sure what your feelings on dogs. No, get them out. Um, but That's as nice. a cat lover, I found this to be quite, uh, quite interesting and equally horrifying. But it's <laughs> it's something really um, different, again, that people don't expect. I didn't expect to find it, but when I came across it, it's something that's really stuck out with or stuck out to me. And it's another thing that I sort of mentioned to people, another quirk in uh, in Canada's past. Hmm. All right, Malin, we'll uh, let you back to it, uh, to your very important work. That you're working. Well, yes, on. it's exam season. Yes. So uh, now this is going to be posted after the actual exam is given. So do you want to give the people a little taste of uh, one of your questions? Well, Sean, that would assume that I've done work on the exam. <laughs> 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 okay, fair enough. All right, I think that's a good way to end it. Perfect. Natalie Klosky, thank you very much. All right, thanks. All right, so that was fun. That was great. A little long-distance podcasting. I love it. And by long distance, I mean four blocks. So moving ahead now, we're going to look at, you know, historical anecdotes aren't always anecdotes. Sometimes you can get the quick hitters. Oh, sometimes those are the best. Yes. And arguably the best of all time is Winston Churchill? I would say so. Yeah. So which one's your favorite Churchill quote? Well, there's a bunch of them out there. But I think one of the ones that just gets me is just the fact that Churchill's bravado and his penchant for just coming up with these great one-liners out of seemingly out of out of the blue, and I've got one here that I pulled up that just kills me every time, and it's Churchill saying, and I quote, "I may be drunk, miss, but in the morning I will be sober, and you will still be ugly." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. I I, I, that's I so just good. I would just I would love to know what she said to him. Yeah. To make him say that to her. <laughs> well, if maybe she just maybe she was just rude. Maybe she cut in line. Maybe, maybe. You know, maybe just it's yeah. So good. Oh, oh it's yeah, so good. <laughs> oh man. So yeah, so that's the one that usually yeah. pops into my brain when I think about Churchill. But you got one too. Yeah, there's the one. Uh, I think it, I think it was Lady Astor. I think, if I'm not mistaken. I couldn't confirm. Um, I don't know. They were in some sort of disagreement, and she said to him, Sir, if you were my husband, I would poison your drink. And he looked at her and said, And if you were my wife, I would drink it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, bam. What is up? Yeah. No, I, I, I feel bad a little bit oh, there. Yeah. I mean, those, those are two Churchill quotes that unfortunately take pot shots at, uh, at our female audiences, uh, our, our listeners here. And uh, I don't think they do. I think no. they take pot shots at those two specific individuals okay, well, at I whom just, they were aimed. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that it's not, we didn't pick those for any. Uh, no. Okay. No, I think those are just the two, maybe even the most notable ones. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't think our female listeners will be offended well that's good i just want to make sure about those because i mean yeah those are just two of the ones that just kind of stick out of, of his more humorous quips yes. i mean he i mean obviously churchill is known for his great uh eloquent speeches especially during the second yeah. world war which you can quote ad, ad nauseum and people have done it in the past but those ones seem to kind of yeah. every time they pop up every so often they they always usually get a good laugh yeah they're yeah. good jokes they're good jokes hey speaking of britain Nicklin! Hey, hey, buddy! Nicklin's here. All right. I'm doing pretty well. How are you? Good. Good. Thanks for coming down. Yeah, no problem. In a big snowstorm. 
Yeah, it was a little. It took a little extra extra time to fight my way here. So, mm -hmm. I'm mostly through back streets, so it is kind of a bit of a trek. Oh, yeah. they, have they plotted at least yet, or are they? Uh, not the my sidewalks? my no. street will probably be late afternoon at earliest. Like it's the back street, back street. So like I'd, li I'd like to point out to uh, to Sean Graham here that my streets out in Nepean were paved or were plowed this morning. Even the sidewalks, and apparently I live out in the middle of nowhere. No, I didn't say you live. I don't. I've never said you live in the middle of nowhere. I said you don't live in Ottawa. Well, the city of Ottawa plowed the streets and sidewalks. Well, they plowed the suburbs. Yeah. Yeah. Because so I just want to point that because out. the suburban people get mad. Oh, is that what it is? Us urban folk okay. are very tough, and well, we, we can we can handle it. Well, we can bus. We can walk. I mean, people out there, if you can't drive, you're what, screwed. Yeah. I took the bus in this morning. Yeah, but it took you an hour and a half. It did take me an hour and a half to get in. Yes, that's, oh. that's very true. You're a commuter. I am. So don't don't say that you live in the city because you don't. <laughs> the same reason the senators aren't really the Ottawa senators. And they no, don't it's play the on it. Yeah. You study civil aviation. One of my favorite shows is May Day. And so that's really the Lincoln. Okay. I love that stuff. Do you have any good plane crash stories? Unfortunately, no. I kind of unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. Too bad. Unfortunately. Yes, we wish we had more plane crash stories. Like, no, I, I, I've seen a few. I mean, some of the some of the material that takes up the most space is plane crashes, but it's not really not really relevant to what I look at. Right. So I I tend to kind of skip over. There are boxes and boxes that I've had to skip over because it wasn't the most relevant. But right. there's plenty of very important crashes that I just didn't look into all that much for my own work. So you got some good archive stories for us. Yeah, yeah. I figured uh, probably the most uh, the most interesting experience I've had with my research was when I went to the British Airways Heritage Center. Now, uh, like you mentioned, I'm looking at civil aviation in general, so this means a lot of national archives. But I tried to look at the airlines themselves, and some of the airlines did keep corporate records I could look at. And British Airways holds on to the records for for BOAC. And since I'm looking at the growth of transatlantic flight, BOAC was the big, big, big British airline that was flying across the North Atlantic. Now, uh, they keep a lot of their stuff just next to Heathrow. Now, the place I was staying, unfortunately, was in North London, and Heathrow is way out in the west, so it was about 90-minute commute every day each way by subway and by shuttle bus to get to the place. But uh, the actual archives are held in this, this gorgeous state-of-the-art museum, which is got to be like five 6,000 square feet. And this is just their, their corporate museum. They bring employees in there, and they've got all kinds of models. They have working demos of the latest technology. They have, like iris scanning technology for some of their new yeah for some of their new security features they got everything loaded up gorgeous museum and uh the research is done in a little kind of glass cubicle right off to the side so i would go in there most days i would sit down but they don't really have the staff for museum and archives they have the same guy who's in charge of museums in charge of the archives so whenever i wanted to do any research i had to flag him down hope he was free and the two of us would go down together would track down the boxes i needed if we could find them and then bring them back up, and I would look through them. And I found almost everything, but there was one or two boxes we were never quite able to track down. Their, their system, it needs it needs a little bit more attention, I think. But uh, we spent... That's we spent the nicest way to say that. I, they had almost everything, and it was almost all where we all expected it to be, but they had one guy who was in charge of all this stuff when... They just, they just, they had it stacks and stacks of shit. where it was supposed to be. Most yeah. of it was where it should have been. Most of it was. <laughs> No, they had tons of stuff, and it was great. And I got some experience as an archivist for the first time in my life, which was kind of interesting to see how that side of our work goes. But uh, it was definitely different having to to go down and just you know pull the boxes, load up the cart myself, and come along. And I, I had great long chats with the guy. His name is Jim Davies, and he's the friendliest guy. It was just it was interesting to get his perspective on flying across the Atlantic, you know, Canadian the British side of things. And so, yeah, we had some great talks. It was just a really interesting place to be. Now, you go, so you go down into the, the place to get these boxes. What does that room look like? It looks like a gigantic storage locker, yeah. more or less. It's just, it's just rows and rows of shelves, um, steel shelves. Uh, the ceilings are a little over a story tall, and the shelves go nearly to the top. So if you wanted to get one of the higher-up boxes, there was a a full-sized aluminum ladder that you would unfold, you'd climb up, you'd bring them down. Hopefully the boxes weren't too heavy so you could get them down. And the shelves themselves probably need to be replaced because they're made out of metal that I'm not quite sure it was designed to hold that much weight for that long because they were buckling <laughs> a fair bit. Like, there's a lot of paper on those shelves. So it, uh, 
If, Earth, if England got earthquakes, it might be more of a problem for them, but I think they'll be okay for a while yet. But uh, it, <laughs> Because if there's an earthquake and these boxes fall, then everything, then most things wouldn't be where they're supposed to be. It would, it would be a bit of a chore putting everything back in yeah, order. Yeah. It, uh, there's, yeah, tens of thousands of, of folders in there. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of good material. And it would be a shame if it uh, ever got out of order too badly. Yeah. Something that's interesting is that, so, so for your stuff, I remember we, we had to do a course three years ago now. Three? Yeah, three years ago now. And we, were, we had to discuss our research proposals and stuff. Mm-hmm. And you came in and you talked about doing the civil aviation stuff. And someone asked, well, well where, are your, where are your materials going to be? And I remember you said, well, you're going to have to go to Paris, London, and Miami. Mm-hmm. And you said something like, yeah, I'll probably go to Paris and, and London in the spring, maybe in the summer. I'll probably head down to Miami January or February. Mm-hmm. And I can't repeat what was said to you after that because this is a family show. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I just remember thinking that you clearly picked, one, you've picked a really interesting topic because I just find aviation really fascinating. And two, that's what you get to do. So you're like making vacations out of research. Yeah. Something I would recommend if anybody has research that takes them out of town to think about what else you could do when you're in some of these places. Like, I went to London last summer partly because I had a relative I could stay with so I would save money, but partly because I knew she was out of town because the Olympics were in London that year and she wanted to get away from the crowds. So I got to see some of the events in person. Like, I just happened upon the women's marathon just wandering the streets one day. (laughs) What? Yeah, I just yeah, I just noticed there was a lot of crowds, and I was like, "Hey, I used to be able to cross that road. What are those barricades doing?" So I walked up, and hey, I got some nice pictures. Yeah, it was a, you didn't know it was going on. No, I knew the Olympics were going on. I didn't know the women's marathon would be in that part of town right then. So I just you know, I climbed up some stairs. I got a couple of shots. So yeah. Oh my god, that's the dumbest luck ever. <laughs> Oh God! So, and but you're not helping your case in this regard of of the response that you got in that room three years ago. No, I'm just saying that you know if if, if it's at all possible that your research is going to take you someplace interesting, try to time it for something that might be worth seeing. Yes, that's fair and that's legitimate, I suppose. <laughs> Says the guy who went to Vancouver during the rainy season. I love Vancouver, but I, <laughs> my my timing probably was a little off on that one. All right, Sean Nicklin, appreciate you coming by. Yeah, not a problem. Thanks for doing it, bud. Oh, not a problem. Talk to you soon. All right, that was great. That was awesome. Sean Nicklin. We love Sean Nicklin. Oh, Sean Nicklin's great. Sean Nicklin's great. He needs to come by more often. It was great to hear those uh, the story about being an archivist, an actual, like, you know, that yeah. literally hands-on experience yeah. of being an archivist. That's, that's uh, right. That's yeah. great. Yeah, most of us don't have the pleasure of... It's like, it was funny, when you asked him that question of what it was like in the archives, mm-hmm. and he explained it as that basically you know that big sterile room with just lots of storage shelves that's what always comes to my mind yeah and it just i i feel vindicated knowing that that's actually what uh, most archives are like you kind of hope it like you want it to be more yeah there, don't you well yeah i i, I mean i kind of i guess in your mind you get this great idea of like you know going down a secret elevator yeah. and then you know you press in a couple buttons and the box gets retrieved from this labyrinth of boxes swirling around but Really, it's probably just that, where a guy goes down and picks up a box. Yeah, it's kind of sad. Yeah, it, it, it's not as romantic. No, no. You want there to be some, something grand. Yeah. I think I'm going to stick to my imagination on that one. Yeah, it's more fun. Yeah. Before we go, you want one more story? Hey, yeah, that sounds great. Right, one more story. All right. It's another baseball story, because I, again, I just really like baseball. It's a Ted Williams story. Okay, now the way it's been told to me is a Ted Williams story. It, what, what's cool about this story is that it's been a number of players over the years who have been involved in this story. It's one of those myth-type things that continues to get spread. But in this, the version of the story that I know is that Ted Williams is at bat, and there's a rookie catcher behind the plate. First pitch comes in. It's a beautiful pitch right over the middle of the plate, belt high. Ted Williams doesn't swing, and the umpire calls a ball. Catcher throws it back to the pitcher. Next pitch, same exact spot. Perfect pitch should be a strike and the umpire calls a ball again the catcher turns around to the umpire and he says why aren't those strikes and the umpire looks at the catcher and goes son those pitches are strikes when mr williams says they're strikes (laughs) (laughs) and that's it there you go that's the lore of ted williams (laughs) if you want to say that doesn't matter who you are in sports to get a call 
that story just tells you everything. There you go. It. Yeah. So there you have it. Beautiful. Historical anecdotes. I like it. Now, feel free, if you're at a party, use any of these. Oh, yeah, please do. Right? Yeah, talk about uh, if, you, if you're a grad student or a historian every time, obviously telling some funny or amusing archive stories are usually great, or obviously refer back to John A. MacDonald yep. or William Henry Harrison's unfortunate, untimely death mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. pneumonia. Yes, tough break. Tough break. And if you have any of your own that you want to share, you can throw them in the comments on Active History at the bottom of the, the post, uh, or you can send them to me at uh, the History Slam email address. And we can maybe even get a conversation or you can tweet something out if you got something good. You can tweet it at me or at Active History. See what you got. I mean, I love this kind of stuff. That'd be great. I'd, I'd love to hear what other, uh, what, uh, what your listeners have to say. It'd be yeah. really great to hear other horror or awesome archive yeah. stories or their own personal favorite anecdotes. Yeah, for sure. Maybe we can get a little discussion going. That'd be great. In this, uh, the last month of the year. This is the last podcast of the 2013 year so. Uh, my thanks to everyone for listening over the past year. We like putting this show together. It's a lot of fun, and, and hopefully uh, you, you enjoy listening to it. So Aaron Boys, thank you for co-hosting. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thanks very much. Uh, anybody, questions, comments for the podcast, historyslamgmail.com. Twitter is at Dr. Shawnee Fever. Have yourselves a healthy and a happy new year. We'll see you in 2014. And as always, if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.